I just want to thank everyone for coming in on a Saturday, on a, on a rainy Saturday at that. And thank you to Harley, Dr. Rosen, and Dr. Miller for the invitation to come and speak to you all. I'm Jamie Fong. I am a genetic counselor at the Memory and Aging Center. And I'm going to talk to you today about direct-to-consumer genetic testing. So as I stand here talking to you about genetic testing, of course, I have to show you this picture. I think this is a ubiquitous enough image that many, if not all, in the room will recognize this as a molecule of DNA. And metaphors about this molecule abound, right? This is the blueprint of life. Um, and so when genetic testing happens, DNA is extracted from a tissue, from blood or saliva, and it's analyzed. And after it's analyzed, out comes this long string of letters that you see here under, underneath this molecule. Um, and so as I was sitting at home and preparing for this talk, um, my attention was actually drawn to uh, something else in the room, my washer and dryer. And, and it got me thinking, you know, um, there's actually a lot of similarities between my washer and dryer and genetic testing. So <laughs> clearly, clearly they're different. I mean, my washer and dryer are not going to help me unlock the mysteries of my ancestry. Uh, my washer and dryer are not going to provide me information that I would want to share with my children. Um, but, you know, as, as my husband and I uh, became new homeowners a couple of years ago, we were faced with buying a new washer and dryer. And we went about it in a way that might sound very familiar to people who have uh, bought uh, genetic testing for themselves. So, uh, you know, at first glance, we're faced with lots of options, lots of brands, different price points. Many machines have numerous features, some of which seemed essential and some sounded cool, but maybe not necessary. So um, it was a big decision and something that took a while. Um, so, you know, with regards to genetic testing, gone are the days of genetic testing only being available in the medical setting or in forensics. And now you can buy genetic testing for yourself at home. Um, and so uh, many of you may be, um, you know, in a position as my husband and I were uh, thinking about our washer and dryer as you think about what, what is the best test for me? How do I unpack all these offerings? So um, there are many companies that are offering direct to consumer genetic testing, also known as DTC tests or at home tests. And um, there are different price points here as well. Um, and there are different features that each company is offering. Um, and even though uh, paternity genetic testing has been around for, for many years by comparison, the direct-to-consumer genetic testing market really launched in the late 2000s. And by 2007, uh, there were companies offering ancestry testing and also a, a few companies offering health trait testing. So in 2008, um, Time Magazine named its invention of the year and the number one on the list was the retail DNA test. And at around this time, you may have read articles about uh, what was then a little startup company. Um, you might have heard its connections to Google. You might have heard about these spit parties that were happening to collect DNA. Really, they were, they were spit parties. And, um, and this was their kit back then. This was the, where you would spit into this tube, you would seal it up, and you would mail it to the lab. Um, and that was then, that was 2008. And this company is still around now, um, and there are many other companies like it. So how has the genetic testing landscape changed? Um, back in 2008, or we'll say before 2008, genetic tests were only ordered by healthcare providers. So that meant providers would determine which was the appropriate test for you. They would order the test from the laboratory. They would help collect and send your sample to the laboratory. And they were the ones to receive results. And then they would sit down and discuss with you those results and help you make medical decisions. And this entire process was usually facilitated by health insurance. Um, things have changed now. Um, certainly, providers can still order genetic tests, but there are certain genetic tests that can be ordered by anyone. So anyone views advertisements on television, on the internet, in print. Anyone can buy these tests online or in the store. Um, you, anyone can provide the sample at home, and then you yourself can ship your sample directly to the laboratory, and then you receive the result. And this is usually not done 
in, in the setting of health insurance. Um, and there's uh, sometimes little uh, professional guidance. Um, so, so you may be wondering, is there a genetic, or excuse me, a direct to consumer genetic test that's right for me? And maybe I'll, I'll pause here and, and survey the audience. How many of you here today have purchased and completed one of these direct to consumer genetic tests? Oh wow, yeah, a fair number. And, and uh, hold on there a moment. And, and so how many of you here today, with the show of hands, sought out this genetic test specifically to seek out health information? Okay, all right, so maybe a, a subset. So, um, so yeah, so for, for those who uh, haven't yet bought a test or are considering it, or maybe you bought a test and you're not sure what you bought, um, I think it's helpful if we kind of introduce some, some terms to kind of help us unpack what's being offered. So um, I, I think it's helpful to ask a number of questions. So does the genetic test have something we call analytical validity? Another way to think about this is, does it accurately depict your DNA code? If the test were done a second time by the same laboratory, would you get the same result? If it were done in a different laboratory, would you get the same result? Does the genetic test have clinical validity? So um, there are a number of other tests that are done in, in a medical setting to determine clinical validity, but I think Broadly, we could maybe ask the question, does it precisely achieve its health-related claims? So that's different from the analytical validity, and we'll come back to that. Does the genetic test diagnose someone with symptoms? Does it identify the cause of disease? Um, and in the case of a genetic test, does it identify the genetic cause of disease? Does it predict a healthy person's future? So does it forecast a disease that is certain to happen in someone who's healthy today? Does it provide risk information? So I would contrast this against uh, predictive information. Uh, in other words, does it identify a chance I will develop disease? So not a certainty, but maybe an increased chance. And does it provide carrier information. So this is a little more wordy, but does it identify an inherited trait that does not cause disease in me, but could be passed down to my child? And if so, that would give my child a chance to have a disease if my spouse were also a carrier. So another way to look at that um, is we have here an illustration of a family, you've got mom and dad on the top, and the question is, does the test identify whether that man is a carrier of a condition? So he's got his two genes below him, one is a working copy, the other one is a non-working copy. He has no symptoms of the disease, so that makes him a healthy carrier of the condition. And only if his spouse has is also a healthy carrier of the condition, does then their child have a possibility to have the condition because the child would have inherited both non-working copies of the gene. So, that, um, and we'll come back to this test kind of testing as well. So if we think about genetic tests in general, these are, it, it could be any test of DNA that is looking for a change in the code. And a handful of genetic tests are not at all health related. And I would put into this category the ancestry testing and also trait testing, so tests to determine whether or not you have a sweet and salty preference, or whether you have wet or dry earwax. Um, <laughs> the, 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 there, there is a test for that. <laughs> um, and typically these are referred to often as infotainment. So these tests are available in the direct to consumer or DTC market. You don't need a doctor's order to get these tests. And then there are health-related tests. And some of those health-related tests have weak clinical validity. So you recall how we kind of sort of defined clinical validity, right? How, how well is it achieving its claim? So um, I would put into this category of tests things like wellness tests. So there may be a company out there that will tell you they can test for whether or not you make um, a gene that makes the protein uh, lactase, which is the enzyme that helps us digest lactose which in milk and dairy products. And, um, 
and say they're going to use that test to help determine your optimum diet and your optimum exercise program. So, so that's that's kind of a big claim. Um, you know, we we don't really have evidence to suggest that that a, your genetic test of lactase is definitely associated with a good optimum diet. The, the data is just not there, right? If, if you have that test for lactase and you deter and it's determined you're lactose intolerant because you don't make enough lactase, um, well, certainly you can avoid dairy products or you could obtain calcium from uh, other sources, but but that's not the same thing as, as there being a claim from a, a clear, a, a genetic test result being associated with optimum diet. So these tests can be ordered uh, directly uh, by the consumer at home. Um, and then there's another group of tests. I would say that these are also health related, but that they have high clinical validity. So something like a test, a genetic blood test that can um, distinguish very accurately someone who has a genetic form of illness, uh, uh, distinguish them from people who do not have the genetic form of illness. And so this, this would be a diagnostic test. And related to that are predictive genetic tests, uh, testing a healthy person's future. So these kinds of health-related tests with high clinical validity can only be ordered by your healthcare provider, at, the, at this time at least. Um, there are some health-related tests with high clinical validity that can be ordered in the DTC market. And those include carrier tests and risk tests. So. Um, your your provider can order those as well, but but these are being offered in the direct to consumer market. So, um, and and again, they have high clinical validity because with regards to a carrier test, it's it's a test that accurately can tell if a person is a healthy carrier of a condition or not. Right. So so this is kind of the landscape of genetic testing, and you'll find that there are companies that offer only non-health related tests, but many actually offer a mix of the three kind of categories of, of testing, both not health related and health related, and both with high clinical validity and with weak clinical validity. So if we go back to the health related tests with high clinical validity, the ones that can only be ordered by your healthcare provider, these are the diagnostic and predictive tests. These include uh, genetic tests for early onset familial Alzheimer's disease. Um, these include tests for genetic frontotemporal dementia and others. Um, they can only be ordered by the healthcare provider. And actually the predictive test is available only if there is a clear genetic disease in your family. Um, with regards to the health-related tests with high clinical validity that can be ordered directly at home, these are carrier tests, and, and they include testing if you're a healthy carrier for a condition called cystic fibrosis, or a healthy carrier for a condition called sickle cell anemia, or Bloom syndrome. Now, not all companies offer this test, but these are some of the health conditions um, that you can learn about. And then there are the risk tests, and those include uh, late onset Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease. So if we just look at late onset Parkinson's, or excuse me, Alzheimer's disease, there's usually only one risk gene that's, that's ever reported, and that's APOE. Um, we know that one or two copies of APOE4 increase your risk for Alzheimer's disease, but it's not definite, right? The, the, there's a chance that you could have one or two copies and not go on to develop Alzheimer's disease. Um, the other risk genes are actually not reported. Um, although, as Dr. Miller alluded to in, in the introduction, there is an emerging space for something called a polygenic risk, risk score. So this would be your risk for Alzheimer's disease based on a number of genes, not just APOE. And that's, that's becoming available. So, what about raw data? For those of you who have already obtained genetic at-home genetic testing, you may have heard of this term. What is it? Do I need it? Um, in the genetic testing setting, I would, I would define raw data as unprocessed genetic information. So if we go to the direct-to-consumer pipeline and the company's got your DNA extracted from saliva, 
they put it onto um, a platform, something they call a chip, and then they, pro they analyze it, and out comes um, information. And this is the unprocessed uh, information. It is the raw data. And now it, it's, um, and then from that, um, additional curation of the raw data happens, and sometimes extra validation happens of certain results, and then out is generated a result report. So typically raw data has more information than a result report, but not all ra raw data has analytical validity. So remember we, we called analytical validity um, a, a way to address the question, how accurate is the result? Um, so I think something to, to take home and remember is that raw data is not all data. And it really depends on what you're looking at. So if we think about your genome, and if we printed all, all the code of your DNA, we would be working with 6.4 billion letters, enough to fill 4,200 books. Um, and this stands in contrast to the amount of data that uh, that is in the raw data that the directed consumer test companies would have. And they would have um, more of the equivalent of 650,000 letters, which is enough to fill maybe half of one book. Um, so, so a stark contrast, right, in terms of the amount of data that you're getting. Um, and so if we go back to the pipeline of testing that we saw, on top being the direct-to-consumer test uh, pipeline, and down below is... Uh, the pipeline of a test that perhaps say you could be, that your provider could order, um, it, it really matters what goes in, right, in terms of how much of the data that you're working with. Because um, one book is, is very different from 40, 40 4,000 plus books. Um, so I think, so the bottom line really is that, you know, it's important to keep in mind that direct-to-consumer genetic tests cannot diagnose a person with symptoms. They cannot give a definite yes or no answer to the question, will I develop disease? And certainly they do not offer an exhaustive analysis of the genome. So, um, so on that note, <laughs> um, <laughs> thank you. <laughs>